Hey guys, welcome to the rotational kinematics video for AP Physics. We might at the end of this get into a little bit about torque or perhaps moment of inertia, but primarily the goal here is going to be talk about to talk about issues related to kinematics in rotation for AP Physics class. So to start with, um, the basic equations for kinematics that you remember from last year and from earlier this year. That one won't work. And this one. All these equations have a counterpart in rotation. But instead of talking about linear displacement, we're going to talk about angular displacement. Or instead of velocity, we're going to talk about angular velocity. Um, so, instead of a V, it, as you ought to recall, it's going to be an omega, not a W. Because if you say W, I'm going to find you. Maybe I shouldn't say that in the video. Okay, well anyway, better not mess up. It's omega. Don't forget it. And instead of an A, it's going to be an alpha. All right. For um, delta x, we're going to have delta theta, okay? And so all of these various equations we can rewrite for use in uh, rotational kinematics, and they all work exactly the same way as you really ought to recall. All right, so if you know, for example, that some um, like a pottery wheel or something like that has an angular acceleration of some number of radians per second squared, um, then, and you want to know the angular velocity after some amount of time, well, then you can go ahead and plug it into this equation here and some numbers are going to pop out. There you go. You solve for it. Okay, so I guess units, alpha, is measured in radians per second squared. Omega is radians per second, and theta is just measured in plain old radians. Fine, so as far as that goes, they work exactly the same way, as long as you know that you're solving for only angular quantities, then these would be the equations to use. On the other hand, it's not always going to be the case that you're only going to worry about angular quantities within a particular problem. For example, it might be nice to know, like, oh, you know, the merry-go-round is going around at, like, one radian per second, but exactly how fast you're moving is going to depend very much on where on that merry-go-round you're standing. Um, same thing goes for things like your centripetal acceleration. Your speed is different depending on where on the wheel you are and so therefore the angular excuse me the centripetal acceleration of say a child trying to hold on to a merry-go-round as it's whirling around is going to be different depending on where they are standing and therefore they're going to have to exert a different amount of you know force to remain in place okay so the relationship between these quantities then works like this that's probably the one you're going to get the most mileage out of, is V equals omega R. But they all look exactly like that. So alpha, excuse me, A equals alpha R, and theta equals, sorry, S, or delta X, rather, equals theta R. Okay, and so uh, if, you know, we were looking at the example of the child on a spinning merry-go-round, right? If here's your merry-go-round, all right, and this spot here is, uh, let's say, 0.75 meters from the center, and this other point over here is 1.5 meters from the center, and the merry-go-round is spinning around at a rate of, oh, let's, uh, let's say, uh, Dad got a little carried away, and it's going at two radians per second. Well, all right. If I want to know how fast a kid located right here is moving, and uh, what his centripetal acceleration is, well, all right. 
is speed, is linear speed or tangential speed. Probably you should label that's what that stands for, linear speed or tangential speed. We can use either term to refer to that. Would be your two radians per second times 0.75 meters. Okay, and so that means that this kid is whirling around at 1.5 meters per second. All right, the other kid who is twice as far away is going to be moving at a different tangential speed. Same angular velocity because they're on the same merry-go-round. but the linear speeds are going to be different. Okay, so twice as fast because he's twice as far out. Um, you could do the same thing if you were talking about something like a catapult, right? While a catapult is firing, the counterweight at one end falls not that fast. I mean, I wouldn't want to stand under it and catch it, but it's not moving very quickly. On the other hand, the other side is going super fast. The reason why it's so different is because the for, the, for their tangential speeds is because the pivot is much closer to the counterweight than it is to the, if you will, the business end that actually throws the, whatever the projectile is, okay? So their tangential speeds are very different because the pivot point is not the same distance from the two ends. All right, fine then. Um, I kept mentioning centripetal acceleration in this example, so let's um, real quick derive one other formula which is going to be useful, or at least occasionally useful. Um, we know, or we ought to know, um, for I've often told you so, I'm sorry, I'm quoting um, um, Hilaire Belloc, pardon me a moment while I get literary. Okay, v squared over r um, is a formula you've seen before. V However, it could be written as omega r. So omega squared, r squared over r. In angular terms then, your centripetal acceleration would be omega squared r, which actually leads to a, a somewhat, in, in my opinion, curious result the first time you see it, which is you would look at this equation and think, ah, the further out you go, the larger r is, the easier it would be to hang on, according to this formula. But of course, you know that's backwards from experience. If you're on this merry-go-round, if you're in the middle, it's easy to hold on. Whereas the people on the outside edges, if it's moving at a pretty good clip, are going to have a much more difficult time you know, maintaining a grip on the handlebars. All right, so the reason why it doesn't work out maybe the way you would expect from this formula is V increases as you move outwards. And so then when you put it in terms of angular velocity and the radius, the centripetal acceleration actually linearly increases as you move away from the center. All right, which bears out with your experience with spinning platforms and things. Okay. There's a lot more we could say about rotational kinematics, but a lot of it would be rehashing stuff that we did last year. And to be quite honest, this is really not the difficult stuff that I want to spend a lot of time looking at with uh, rotation. Rather, I would like to spend more time looking at torque and moment of inertia. Okay, so let's do that. We said moments ago that Every linear quantity has a rotational analog. Analog meaning this thing is analogous to that other one, right? This one is like that one. Um, so this formula, F equals MA, has a rotational analog. Instead of force, we talk about torque. I mean, if you want to make something spin in the first place, you obviously have to apply a force to it, but you can't apply a force just anywhere on it and imagine that it's going to rotate. So uh, when we talk about force in, uh, or the, the rotational analog of force, it's torque. 
all right? And from the, the, the analog to this equation is torque, this symbol is tau, but you can just say torque, equals I alpha. Okay, so torque, which we'll have another formula for in a little bit, equals moment of inertia All right, and then this is, of course, your angular acceleration. Um, in terms of units for these things, um, torque is measured in newton meters. You'll see why in a minute. And moment of inertia is measured in kilogram meters squared. And for that one, we'll also see why perhaps later. Okay, not, not right this moment. Okay, torque. Um, we said you'd see where this formula comes from. That's going to happen right now. Torque is this formula, F cross R. It's not just a multiplication X. It's a cross product, which, if you recall, is a type of vector multiplication. When you do cross products, the magnitude of the result is proportional to in this case, the force and the radius, and then also the angle between those two things. So that means that if I uh, want something to rotate, okay, according to this formula, uh, a couple of things got to be true. Number one, I can't apply my force like at the center of the object, or rather at the center of the axis of rotation. All right, so take for an example. Because of the limitations of video here, I, I won't try to like walk over to a door and show you this because the door is over there. You can't see it. But okay, here's a door. There's the hinge, right? All right, hinge is attached to door frame. Okay, whatever. All right, so that means that if I walk over to the door and I apply a force right here, the door doesn't rotate because Given that that's the axis of rotation, according to this formula for torque, R is zero, and therefore, of course, the door is not going to rotate. All right, now, that's not the end of the story there, right? Just because I apply a force way out here at the edge of the door, which is where you ought to apply a force if you want the door to rotate in any way, or at least rotate easily, right? The closer you push to the hinge, the harder it's going to be to cause that or to experience any kind of an angular acceleration. Fine. That's not the only way that I could mess up trying to make the door rotate. The other way involves this sine theta. So if I come over here to the door and here's the doorknob, right? right? And there's probably a doorknob on the other side too. If I grab the doorknob like this and just lean back, the force that I'm applying in that direction um, is not going to cause the door to rotate for a different reason. The, um, the F and R here are actually both vectors. So force, we should all be good at the same force as a vector, but the R part, that's something referred to as the radial vector, which is a straight line drawn from the pivot to the point of application of the force. Okay. So I'm ignoring the dimension, the, like the, the depth of the door here. I'm just going to say, all right, here's my point right there. If I draw like so, there's my radial vector. Okay, straight line drawn from the pivot to the point of application of the force. And you'll notice that in this circumstance, the radial vector and the force vector are parallel. That means that the angle between them is zero degrees. And as everybody knows, sine of zero is zero. So that means that pulling like this, or for that matter, pushing directly towards the hinges, exerts a force, but doesn't produce a torque that would cause the door to rotate. All right, now, in our next video, we're going to look at moment of inertia so you can understand what the connection is between torque